<coughs> a couple of lines in that hymn that I, each verse that I find really challenging, but I, I love the lilt of it, if I put it that way. And, and, and I noticed uh, for the first time the idea uh, of God's love binding us like a fetter. You, know, you want to be free, here's the chain you need. This is the leash we should all be on. We should be held fast by the love of God. It's, that's a captivating idea. And today uh, we've come to Advent. Uh, it's come around again. I, I was struck by the local church, St. Augustine's near where we live. Suddenly they've got the illuminated creche in the window and it's and it just seemed like yesterday. And I think COVID has played tricks on our sense of time because it's no time at all since it seemed like Christmas already. And here we are, and this is the second Sunday in Advent, but it's also only the second time that we've had the opportunity to share communion together this year. And so I would like in the next couple of Advent Sundays to take the idea of a saviour, the coming of a saviour, and think how the scriptures speak about salvation, what Christ has done. And in the, uh, in the reading which Ian read to us so evocatively, we have the image of angels longing to look into what the prophets are exploring in their vision and understanding, what God is working into the history of the Jewish people. And so here is something that we're looking into. We're looking into redemption today, one of the great salvation words. And we're going to see that it will bring us to, to Holy Communion itself. It will bring us to that point. Thinking about redemption, I've used the image of the cup and the loaf to remind us uh, where we're going in this service, but also what the Saviour came to accomplish according to the Gospels. So uh, four big ideas that come out of the passage that Ian read. I'm really trying to confine myself to a few of the verses because they're, it's quite long and quite challenging. And as Ian said, there's a very long sentence there. Uh, the Greeks are not constrained the way we are because they just change the, the, uh, the grammar of a service to keep running it on and on. And they can have much longer sentences uh, than, than we have. And uh, some of the letters are a bit like that. But the four things I want to pick on, first of all, I want to think about the empty life, the worthless life, Peter says, that you used to live. And then I want to think about Jesus' costly sacrifice. And then a new kindled belief. This is something that was awakening in the lives of people to whom he was writing. And as we've seen in our journeys through the Apostle Paul's uh, ministry, uh, new ideas as people began to wrestle with the ancient scriptures and see in Christ uh, crucified a saviour. And then finally, I want to think about how a God-conceived life might look. What might that be? So let's just take these one at a time, beginning with the empty life. Now, the empty life reminded me of T.S. Eliot's poem, The Hollow Man. I don't know if you know that line. It's the famous poem. It's it's reckoned that the last four lines of that poem are the most quoted poetry of the 20th century. Um, how do, what are the last four lines of that poem? Well, it's not difficult to remember. This is the way the world ends. This is the way the world ends. This is the way the world ends. Not with a bang, but a whimper. The hollow men. They're men who have kind of like the walking dead. And it made me realize how... The young people today are really interested in zombies. They're kind of interested in the walking dead. They're interested in you know, ideas about life and afterlife. Strange things. What does it mean, uh, this worthless way of life to which uh, Peter refers in, in this passage that we're looking at? Well, as Christine said, we, we went to Sydney this past week. Uh, we drove there in horrible weather and we cruise back on a cloudless day dry roads and beautiful so that was friday so it's it's been uh, 20 hours in the car uh, what do you do when you're 20 hours in the car well you talk a fair bit 
Sometimes you listen to music, sometimes you think you listen to news. But in recent years, we also have taken audio books with us, Audible. And so we've been listening to several books. Uh, and one of them that's been on again, off again with us is uh, Jimmy Barnes' memoir. It's called Working Class Boy. Some of you may have know about it. It's, I understand there's been a uh, documentary of it on TV. And Jimmy Barnes says this. He it said it in the book, he reveals how writing his memoirs, the therapy he cons consequently underwent to deal with the demons of his past, probably saved his life. He says these words, if I hadn't started writing, I probably wouldn't have been around for long. I'd already gotten to the point where I woke up with a rope hanging in the dressing room. I was a ticking time bomb, and the process of writing helped to diffuse that. Now, what did we find so challenging about what Barnsey said? Well, as Christine has already said, we, she and I are both Scottish. We grew up in the same town as Jimmy Barnes, just a little bit ahead of him. What was Glasgow like? Well, it had devastated buildings all over it. It had been a war zone, remember? Clydeside got bombed in the war. There were losses of all kinds, and families were really messed up. And people were struggling to get their lives back together. And my family, like his family, left Scotland and came to Australia. I went to Broadmeadows in Melbourne. He went to Elizabeth in Adelaide. Working class suburbs filled with people who had come out from Europe to escape for a better life, looking for something other than the war-damaged Europe that they left behind. And what struck me, uh, what struck both of us, was how different Jimmy Barnes' upbringing was from ours. He had to struggle with so many, many issues that just seemed to go, and the way he described them was so intense that we had to stop listening. And so we've listened to this book. Uh, I don't think we've even got to the end of it yet. Uh, it, it, working Class Boy ends when he joins uh, a band uh, called Go wasn't Goanna, was it? No. Anyway, it, it ends when he joins a particular band. Um, but, the, but the thing that was hard was uh, the language that he used, the, the, the violence, uh, the drunkenness, uh, the drug taking. It all seemed to come with him and, and, and invade his life here as it had in Glasgow. And, and, and you couldn't help but think, what was different for us? That, well, there were some differences. We saw some of the same issues arising in, in, our, in our own communities and even in our own families. But we were blessed in many ways not to have the terrible emptiness that Jimmy Barnes uh, found in his own life. He, he hated what he was. And just recently I noticed that he said well, he's starting to like the person he's becoming. <laughs> He, and he doesn't want his children to have what he had. And he doesn't want his grandchildren. And if you were listening to him during the lockdowns, the long lockdowns that we had here, you'll know that he and his wife put out songs for us to listen to and to cheer people up. And it was a, just a lovely gesture on his part to bring something better into the community that he felt had helped him so much. So I just want to say that it is possible for life to feel really empty. And people look for meaning and purpose. Do I, does my life have value? What makes me of, it, of any value at all? And we know that it's because God has created us in his own image. He's created us for himself. And part of that means that we like to connect to other people. We love being in community. I've only met two people in my life who were hermits. And one of them, although he lived isolated, he always wanted to get together. He, I had to pick him up on the Scottish island of Mull and take him to church because he didn't want to miss church even though he was a hermit. And there were only four people in church that day. It's great to have a crowd today. <laughs> so, so God has made us for himself. And if we, unless we discover that, we're going to find our lives empty. As St. Augustine said in the fourth century, you have made us for yourself. And our hearts are restless till they rest in you. But the second thing that I want to draw attention to is what I've called Jesus' 
costly sacrifice. Now it's Christmas. Christmas is coming. Um, and I've said that this is Advent. This is the time of the year, remember, that Christ came to us. I noticed that uh, the British ministers who were deciding on a slogan for COVID at Christmas were saying, had the slogan, don't take COVID home for Christmas. But they decided it was too sectarian because not everybody celebrates Christmas. So it's don't take COVID home for the festive season. <laughs> doesn't have quite the same ring to it. But we think about Christmas. The world has been invaded in a way by the birth of a child that has challenged us all. We call it Advent, this period of time as we in the church come near to the birth of the Christ child, the child who has changed our world. And if Tom Holland is to believe, who is ch changing it still in his uh, great book, Dominion, how did Christ become so influential in the world? Well, as Christians, we believe in what we call the incarnation. I use the old font because I thought it would look a little bit more Christmassy. I don't know if it does or not. I normally use a font that's uh, clearer to read. So what, what we're thinking of here is in Advent, there's a long-awaited and strangely foreshadowed thing in the Hebrew Scriptures. It's, it has to do with being purchased with his own blood. And this is the sacrifice. Those of you who were here two weeks ago will remember I used this uh, a slide because this is the, the, the expression St. Paul uses when he's speaking to the elders of the church in Ephesus in Acts 20. And, and, the, and the idea of God having the ability to purchase with his blood or the blood of his own one, it could also be translated, is a challenging idea. But it's not just suddenly new in the, in the New Testament. It's sort of hidden there in the Old Testament too. You'll find it in Zechariah where it says, then they, this is Yahweh speaking, the God of Israel, then they will look on me whom they have pierced and mourn for him. Now what does that strange Hebrew saying mean? Scholars have struggled with it and they've found ways of trying to give it expression. But what it says is they will look on me whom they have pierced. And, and there are other places as well where we get hints of something strange happening. And that's what brings us to the cross of Christ. And, and so I used this slide last week. But I'm concealing that for the moment because we're, we're going to be thinking in Advent of the birth of a child. A child as human as you and me in that he bleeds and dies, that he's thirsty, that he weeps. All of those things that are so human, Jesus does too. So let us remember him. His, his divinity does not in any way minimize or negate his humanity. So we're thinking about uh, a sacrifice that's being made and it's going to be made by this baby that we remember. And I, I want to suggest that there's a new kindled belief here and, and it comes from the cross, from this slide, but it comes into this world, the Roman world. Let's just think about it for a moment. I don't know if you, if you can imagine the Roman world, but it, it looked a little bit more like this than three crosses on a hill. In the, in the movie Spartacus, some of you might remember it from a long time ago with Kirk Douglas. Spartacus was a, a gladiator and his tale is told uh, and the things that are agreed is that he did lead a revolt of gladiators uh, against Rome and he, he was a significantly capable military man. But in the end he got crushed. Rome destroyed him. And his followers were crucified on the, along the Appian Way. When we were looking at the journeys of Paul, we saw the Via Ignatia went across the top of Greece to a point on, on the coast. And from Brindisi in Italy, you had to cross to that point to join the Appian Way. Well, the App join the Via Ignatia. The Appian Way was the road from Rome to Brindisi. And along that road, like telegraph poles, they crucified 6,000 rebels. 
6,000. When the Romans destroyed Jerusalem, they got so short of timber for the crosses and the crucifying that they nailed people to the walls of the city. You drive a Roman spike between the stones and somebody just hangs there. Now this is a totally horrible, but it was a very common thing. Romans couldn't be crucified. It was so distasteful they didn't even use the word cross. So the question is, how does one image in the sea of crosses, how does one image come to have a dominant position? How is it that we remember Christ, Jesus? What does his cross do that is different? Well, we probably wouldn't have remembered or noticed if it hadn't been that his followers said, he's alive. They went to the tomb and it was empty. It never became a place of pilgrimage in the early days because everybody knew it was empty. So what happened? And then there were appearances over a period of 40 days. And to try and uh, of, to explore the dimensions of this mystery, uh, books and books have been written. And the simplest of all challenge, of, of all resolutions to the complicated issue is that if we receive the, resur the resurrection of Jesus Christ, it explains why the tomb was empty, why the disciples were changed, the existence of the church. If, if, we, if we come up with any other idea, and there are lots of other ideas have been suggested. Um, one was that uh, Jesus merely passed out on the cross and they took him down quickly because they wanted the bodies off the crosses before the end of the day and in the coolness of the tomb, Jesus revived. Got out of the grave clothes, rolled a stone aside and walked to the city on hands and feet feet that had been impaled and convinced his disciples that he was the Lord of life. That was Venturini's suggestion in the 1800s. Other people said it's just made up, it's just a fantasy. But if it was just a fantasy, can you square that with the disciples actually willing to die for this cause? Especially those who knew from the inside of the, the story, who said they had seen the Lord. It's very hard to square that psychologically. And so here we have this great challenge that Christ is risen. The church affirms that Jesus died, the Messiah is crucified. They didn't <coughs> expect the Messiah to be crucified. They, were, they had a whole lot of string of, 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 of would-be messiahs who were crucified, who died and were passed aside. And then they said, well, maybe his brother is the messiah. In the hundred years before the time of Christ, the Maccabees, you've heard that name, there were seven brothers and they, or each one might have been the messiah, but when they died, they said, no, he wasn't the messiah. But something was different when Jesus was crucified. It was a claim that he was risen. And not only that, that he will come again. And he will put the world to right. Messiah, of course, just means, it's a Hebrew expression for the word Christ. And these are Christian affirmations. Christ is crucified. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. These are the things we celebrate. They were not a surprise to Jesus. When he celebrated the Last Supper with his disciples, he arranged for them to collect the donkey. And he rode into Jerusalem to fulfill the prophecy of Zechariah chapter 9. Your king comes to you, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So here we have a newfound belief that, that, that a crucified <coughs> Messiah could be God's way of speaking to us through the pain and the suffering, through enduring it, through the shedding of his blood, to the giving of his life, an invitation to believe in a costly sacrifice made for us.
And so that brings us to a God-conceived life. Now, how does God conceive life? What, what does it mean to be alive, really? What is our life? <laughs> and what can we give for our lives? I mean, how amazing it is. And, and, and there's so much here that we could, we could sit around a table and discuss for ages. Uh, and, and I've penned just a few things at, at the end of the notes. I've said, ignorant and insufficient as we are, we have been loved from all eternity. These are, this is, I believe that's a Christian affirmation. We have been loved before we knew it. In fact, the, the wonder of an ordinary birth is that a child is ordinarily loved before he or she knows it. That's a wonderful thing, isn't it? How sad when a child is not loved or not wanted. And this love that God has shown to his human family has been actively pursuing us with redemptive intention. God wants you and God wants me. He wants you. He wants you to be his. Jesus said, other sheep have I which are not in this fold. Them also I must gather. And so the mission in Matthew's gospel is to go out and, and make disciples. Tell the message. Share the good news. God has loved you. And in history has acted to redeem you, to, to pray the, pay the price of your liberation. That's what redemption is. It's the cost of a slave. And in a, in a society which was based on slavery, as the Roman Empire was, Redemption was a common concept. It's not so common today. It's almost always used with religious uh, uh, overtones, but it wasn't in those days. Uh, this idea of God's intention reminds me of uh, that poem, is it by Thompson? Uh, the hound of heaven, he sought me down. The labyrinthine ways of my own mind. Just about God pursuing us. And we, we can't escape that God God is, is coming for us. He seeks us to know him. That the creator could and would suffer to ensure our redemption has the power to generate love of others in the unlovely and in the unloving. What a wonderful transformation that would be. What are the markers? What shows that this is happening in a person's life? Well, I think we know that Jesus said the love of God and the love of our neighbor are the, are the key ideas. This is the great command. Love God and let it be seen by loving your neighbor. Where is God? God is among us in his people, by his spirit. And we should be able to see the hints of Christ likeness in one another. Just as Christine picked up on Helga McFarlane and, and the, this act of generosity that is kindled in her by the love and concern that she knew her mother had so treasured. It's a wonderful thing. And so a commitment to fellow believers and the kiss of Christian love are both mentioned by Peter as you read through the letter. Loving one another, caring about one another, and at the end he says, greet one another with a kiss of love. And so it's... Uh, uh, there are markers that show that uh, a new awareness has grown in the lives of those who truly uh, follow Jesus and have been touched by his sacrifice for, uh, for them. And uh, at the end, of course, I've said sharing in the meal that he gives us. We're, we, are, we share the one loaf. It's, there's a common cup, even though we don't drink from a common cup. Even pre-COVID, we mostly didn't. But nevertheless, we, we have one real life source. That is that God has given himself wholly to our well-being. And do we receive that? So uh, the sharing in the meal that speaks of our redemption, the Lord's Supper, is what we will do. And in a few minutes after we've prayed, we will uh, sing a hymn of approach to the table. And uh, I'll turn off the streaming and uh, we will share together in that in that meal, signifying our redemption. Amen. Shall we, shall we join together in prayer? Let us unite our hearts in prayer.
Lord Jesus Christ, you have come to us lovingly and with redemptive purpose as Mary's son. As we bow before you in prayer, we acknowledge that too often we have turned to our own way and been blind to your path in our lives. Draw us with the cords of love from all that is vain and which betrays our true humanity, that we might be restored anew as your children. Forgive us our vain glory and hollow ambitions. Help us to worship only you. May we love and serve you as you have loved and served us, served us even to the shedding of your own lifeblood. It is a thing too marvellous for us to comprehend. But lead us in our thinking and enable a genuine and earnest response to your grace toward us. Help us to taste and see that the Lord is gracious. As we read our Bibles, open our eyes to see all that you've done to restore faith, hope and love to your world. You are yourself the gift of the Father. Open our eyes to those rich veins of truth which the angels yearn to understand. Help us to be holy in ways that you are holy, spending our lives here in reverence, not allowing them to be shaped by ignorant desires, but by the Spirit of the Lord Jesus. Thank you that no act of kindness or generosity escapes your notice. We think of the kindness of Helga McFarlane and the provision she made for the Vessel family. Help your church to be similarly generous in practical and kindly acts. In a world racked by wars and rumours of wars, we turn to you, Lord Jesus, asking that you will bring peace. We pray for Ethiopia, Yemen, Syria, for the tensions on the Russian-Ukraine border today and in the Taiwan Straits. Soften the hearts of ruthless and self-seeking leaders to see the plight of the people whom they should be serving, to see that where there is no vision, the people perish, and that sin is a reproach to any nation, and that those who live by the sword shall die by the sword. Help us in the affluent Western society to share and be generous. Forgive us our attitude to those seeking asylum in our country. Help us to welcome the stranger, to care for the widow and the orphan, to bind up the brokenhearted and to heal the sick. As COVID continues to evolve, guide medical researchers and doctors to protective vaccines that will hinder the spread of the virus and keep the community safe, especially protect those with heightened vulnerability, guide our leaders as they navigate the issues relating to COVID-19 in the months ahead. Help us to care for and to protect the planet so that the balance is maintained between sustainability, productivity and amenity. Guide politicians as they produce policies that harness renewable energy and decrease pollution and waste. Help us as we weigh up our own practices in these matters. Help us also in our relationships with one another. Help us to avoid deceit and pretense and to enjoy goodwill and honest communication that will demonstrate your reign in our lives. We commit to you our elderly, frail, troubled and sick friends this morning. We think of Will, of Nola, of Manfred, of Ogilvy and others, and in the quietness of our hearts we lift them and others to you. So, Lord, gather, gather us all as your church. Unite us 
whether we're here in person or at your footstool where we, where we live. Keep us in your care and unite us as we pray with the whole church the words which Jesus taught us to say. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Our hymn of approach. Um, it would be really interesting to know how many times this hymn has been sung by members of this church. If we were to add them up. Hear, O my Lord, I see thee face to face. Here would I touch and handle things unseen. So we, as we uh, sing this, the first three verses of this hymn, uh, we will uh, unveil the table and I'll stop the streaming of the service. Let us sing together hymn 323 verses 1 to 3. 